Well, aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Um, I'm calling to you today from the Big Island at the Natural Energy Laboratory Authority, NELHA. And uh, we're host, our host uh, is the Hawaii Energy uh, Policy Forum, uh, who look uh, for good policies and support them when they're good. And when we have policies we don't like so much, then maybe we don't support those. So uh, the funding is provided by my uh, parent organization, uh, HNEI. And uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, um, Laurence Lombardier from Nelha. She's the deputy uh, director here, and she's going to tell us, she's going to open us up. We have several guests here today. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this works. So Laurence. All right. Thank you, Mitch. Um, we're really pleased um, to be able to share um, some progress that we've made on a U.S. DOE grant, um, which is a desalination, forward osmosis desalination project um, that we have ongoing and which is currently in full swing at the Natural Energy Laboratory of Hawaii um, Authority. And this is on four acres um, concentrated um, solar um, panel array that um, is in existence and is being reactivated. Um, we're really excited about the progress that is happening. And I have the principal here, which is Alex Leonard, our chief um, operations, excuse me, our chief projects officer. And um, he is the PI on this project and will be giving you some more information on what's been the exciting developments that have been happening here. But before we start with Alex, uh, first of all, we have a public service announcement from Shannon Tonganan from Hawaii Electric. So Shannon, what's new at Hawaii Electric today? Well, we're super excited to announce that last year, 2019, we had a 21% um, increase in solar generating capacity over 2018. So we really want to share, you know, that we're making a lot of progress. Um, a lot of that came from two um, large scale, grid scale projects, um, three under Clearway, and that's in like central Oahu, and also our Westlock solar project. That's great. So when are those uh, going to be coming online? Oh, they, they came online, um, I believe, third and fourth quarter. Okay. Yeah. So what other uh, solar projects have you guys got going on? I think there's a, is there an RFP on the street or is that now? Yeah, um, we have our yeah. first phase and those eight projects, actually seven right now, are going through the process. Um, they have not gotten... Um, all the details worked out, but those are going to be coming online um, hopefully soon. And then we also have the uh, second phase RFP, and we're going through proposals right now, um, along with our independent observer. And we're looking through the proposals to see, you know, what kinds of projects are upcoming. So and, you're going to have a, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, we just wanted to also highlight that for um, our residential solar, we ha you know there was a big um, jump as well. We had about nearly 3,500 systems come online. Um, so now we're at about um, 78,000 residential solar systems across our five island service territory. So that's, uh, that's quite a lot of solar. And you guys are making great progress towards uh, meeting our uh, goals here in Hawaii. So well done. Thank you. You know, we have a lot more that we have to do, uh, we know, to get to 100%. But I think we're making good progress. Excellent. So I'm going to uh, switch over now to Alex, who's going to talk to us about a great project they have here at Nelha. So Alex. Thanks, Mitch. Talk to us about forward osmosis. Well, I won't talk to you so much about forward osmosis yet. I'm going to ask, ask the question, why water? Why is, why is, why is Nelha focusing on water? Right. Um, there's no question that as a, as a, as a, as a, that humankind is facing a global water shortage with 2 billion people without access to safe drinking water, about 4.5 billion people living in, in water, what are called water risk zones, where they have no access, inadequate access to clean water for, san for basic sanitation reasons and with uh, increasing pressures on global water systems from global warming from, or climate change, um, from popula human population growth and uh, environmental degradation, 
the problems are only getting worse. So there's there's an imperative for, for us to address these, these issues. NELHA's doing what we can uh, on this front with the help of a, of a $5 million grant from the U.S. Department of Energy. You ask why the U.S. DOE would, might be interested in, in water. Well, there's, there's a, a very powerful, strong nexus between energy and water. Um, their, their production and, and their is interrelated and interdependent. Um, energy accounts for about 15%, energy production accounts for about 15% of global water usage. Um, and so DOE have recognized this fact and, and have decided to step in and, and, and advance technologies that might help solve some of the crisis. Um, NELHA on our side are a significant water user on the, uh, on the west side of, of the Big Island, most of it for agricultural purposes. And we recognize that if we um, are to do our part in maintaining resources, natural resources for the greater good, we should try to find better sources of water than what we're currently using right now, which is potable water, which is, uh, uh, for, like I said, is being used for agricultural uses. So we're partnered with Trevi Systems, and I'm pleased to have with us here today Victor, Victor Ivashin, uh, Ivaskin and Sergei Charamko from Trevi Systems. Um, there are engineers who are working on development of the next generation of desalination technology, which relies not on reverse osmosis, but forward osmosis, which is a completely different process. And uh, I'm very happy to be able to turn it over to, to Sergey, and he can tell us all how it works. Thank you. Um, forward osmosis is membrane-based process where water stream, which is seawater introduced on one side, and uh, 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 on another side of the membrane, we introduced draw solution, which has high affinity to water, and water from the seawater is transferred across the membrane into the draw solution. Hang on, could I just ask for the uh, fourth slide to be thrown up on the on the door? We'll get to that. So. Yeah, so on the slide you see there is FO membrane. That's where the uh, water transfer from the seawater into the draw solution happens. And dilute draw uh, has to be regenerated and reused in this system infinitely. Uh, so in our process, draw solution loses high affinity to water when it's brought to elevated temperature. So that a weak draw solution comes through the set of the heat exchangers and goes into a, a separation uh, tank where the uh, water is separated from the draw solution. The concentrated draw solution comes back to a foam membrane to repeat the process, but the uh, water generated goes uh, through secondary uh, cleaning and conditioning and it's available for consumption. And our main component is that we are using heat for uh, desalination, unlike reverse osmosis, which uses uh, a lot of electrical power to create high pressure to force water through the membrane. Uh, in our case, draw solution by chemical attraction brings the water on the other side of the membrane, and we use heat, which is more available, which is more economical, to uh, make uh, fresh water out of the seawater. So how, how, what, what's the temperature of the heat that, that will uh, um, trigger this process? Like how hot does it have to be? It still is below boiling temperature. So okay. it's roughly about 195, 200 Fahrenheit. Okay, so it's relatively low grade It is, heat. exactly, it is a low grade heat, which is available a lot of places and it doesn't come at high cost of, uh, let's say, uh, PV or uh, high temperature steam. Right. So we are becoming um, a more um, economical and uh, simpler process for making fresh water. So what kind, of, <clears throat> what kind of efficiencies do you get and how does that compare to what they call reverse osmosis, which requires a lot of pressure to force the water through the membrane? So why, what's your secret sauce and why, why, you know, what are the energy efficiencies that you, you get out of it? The uh, energy efficiency comes from uh, the fact that instead of 
creating electricity for uh, driving high pressure pumps, we are using raw heat, which is basically more simple uh, source of energy. And uh, on mechanical side, we don't use any pressure at all. Right. So electrical consumption is much lower than a uh, uh, reverse osmosis system. Okay. But we do use heat for uh, uh, regenerating draw solution. And that's the secret that you use heat instead of electrical uh, power. So where are you getting your heat from? Well, in this case, we are lucky to have uh, an Elha to uh, provide us with solar heat. Number one. Can we uh, throw up slide number one? And slide number two. So, there you go. Yeah, so this is the um, um, uh, concentrated solar uh, array, which is uh, providing uh, enough heat uh, to make 500 cubic meters of water per day. So typically, what, what's the heat level or what's the temperature of the solution or that, that you're able to capture from these? Uh, this array? Uh, as far as I know, it's uh, uh, 300 uh, uh, C, uh, but in our process, we are uh, diluting that heat to just uh, below boiling temperature water. Right. And uh, so we are using it uh, at more um, uh, economical way. We are not pushing at the full temperature, but we actually can uh, uh, use uh, less of that heated oil in our process to make right. our fresh water. Okay, so um, so about how many gallons of water can you process uh, using your system and the um, and, and the array that we have up here at the Nelha? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what is it in gallons. It's uh, okay. 500 cubic meters per day, but uh, I really don't don't have it on my. I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm very metric. <laughs> 130,000. Is it 130,000 uh, 30, gallons per day? It's 130,000 uh, uh, gallons a day. Right. That's what I've, I've been told right now. So, uh, you know, the uh, sun only shines a few hours per day. Are you able to capture some of that heat and uh, have thermal storage so that you can uh, run your process? Uh, can you run it for 24 hours? Can oh, yeah. You, you can. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. The uh, heated oil can be stored in uh, storage tanks. And um, at night, when there is no uh, sun available, that stored uh, oil is still being used to produce hot water, which we need to uh, regenerate draw solution and make fresh water out okay. of the seawater. And what are you doing with all this water that you're producing here at Nelha? How is that being used? Slide number three. Slide, uh, can we have a look at slide number three? So I understand that uh, Cyanotec uses a lot of uh, fresh water just because of evaporation. I was astounded to see that the sun evaporates 450,000 gallons of fresh water per day. So, and fresh water is very valuable here in Hawaii. So, um, so providing 150,000 gallons a day is a big, great help. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. so that's great stuff. So. So I'd like to bring in Victor and uh, maybe talk about the systems engineering side. I mean, the, uh, the electrical and, and how do you control all this system? So, okay. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the comments. Our system uses an artificial intelligence and that artificial intelligence is state of the art. We use a programmable logic controller. We accomplish what's called the IPSO functions. That's the input process, storage and output functions. On the input side, in our water system, we need to watch close to 160 points. And that's for things such as pressure, temperature, pH, conductivity, resistivity, silt density, uh, dissolved oxygen. There are very technical things that we watch. And then depending on what we see, we then control them through controlling of pressures, controlling of pumps, controlling of various parameters, dosing things. We try to get the system to be exact. Now, it takes a very intelligent microprocessor set of systems to do that. 
So we program these systems to do that based on parameters that we see during the day. Sometimes things change, temperatures change, the climate changes things, the salinity of water changes. So our artificial intelligence has got to monitor that and then control that. That's the input function. The process function follows from that, and along with that comes something called the human-machine interface. We need to provide to the human operators here at NILHA the ability to see what's happening on a real-time basis, on an every second basis, and then allow them to be alarmed if something is going wrong, allow them to change parameters if they'd like, because even though we more or less know what we're doing, we need to allow the operator to make changes should they wish to perhaps do some maintenance, maybe dose something a little bit different and so forth. So that's part of the process and that's part of the the storage part of the system. We then need to take the data and put it into a log file. And that's so that the, here at NILHA, over the months and the weeks, they can see how the system is operating based on the climatic changes, the water changes, and so forth. So the third function of storage is important. Our processors, state of the art, will store that. And finally, there's an output function. The output function is where we take the information and we can shuffle it anywhere around the world. We're going to provide NELHA with the ability to use their even their cell phones to be able to monitor the system, to understand how it's working, to understand how effective it is, and to be able to control it. Further, we can, in California, where our company is, be able to look at the system's operation, change the parameters, update any software that we need to do so. So my team is focused on putting together that programming using the most latest technologies that are currently available. As you know, self-driving cars are hooked into the internet. There's all the GPS coordinates hooked into the internet, and we likewise will be hooked into the internet. That means anywhere on this island or anywhere on the state of Hawaii or in California, we can see the results that, ne that, that, were, that are being generated here. So all in all, that's what my team does. It's an electronic, artificial intelligence that completely controls the system 24 seven. So Victor, do you actually need any people up there? <laughs> well, I think, uh, do you mean, do we need people to run the system? Yeah, run the system. Like, uh, well, absolutely. Sounds like your system is like totally well, automated. The system is fully automated, but there's always the maintenance parameters. Right. You know, even so, the time, the filters and things sometimes need to be changed out. Sometimes something needs to be tweaked. Right. And even though we are not robots, uh, some of the valves and things may need to be maintained some of the time. Uh, we, this is a well-established protocol. We've built several systems around the world, and we're very fortunate to be able to do it here at NELHA. So I'm really looking forward to this challenge, and it's going to be very straightforward. It's complex, but it's going to work perfectly, I think, and I think you'll really enjoy the result. Okay. So uh, what other, where else are you looking at, uh, or where else do you have these systems installed? We have, uh, we started out in Marin County in California. Right. And we built a small system there that was our experimental system. And then the next one was put up in Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait needed water for their region. And they actually are not only making water, desalinating it, but they're putting uh, chemicals in the water to protect the health of their people. They're actually right. adding chemicals to it. And we were in a contest with the uh, United Arab Emirates out of Dubai. Uh, it was called the Mazdar Project. And there we were pitted against four other water uh, desalinators. And we won the top award for being the most effective uh, and the most efficient way of doing water using uh, forward osmosis. So that's that system. We've also got systems in India. We have systems going towards China, Malaysia, that part of the world. The problem there is that it's 12 hours different between there and us. And so when they call us at two in the morning or four in the morning, which is really their time, two or four o'clock in the afternoon, it's difficult. The fortunate thing about here is that we're just two hours away from the mainland. And the, the suppliers that you might need for a filter or whatnot are local. So we can get things here very quickly. We're really looking forward to this system as being a showcase for us. It's also the largest system that we've built. And uh, it's very scalable. So once we get the system built, we want to go 10 times the size. It'd be very easy to do. Okay. So um, this is a pretty uh, corrosive environment we're at, uh, at Nelha. I, I know I have a hydrogen system here. And the salt air environment is uh, pretty aggressive. How, how are you finding that here? And and I also understand most cities in the world uh, are 
within a, a, either on a coastal plain or pretty close to the ocean. So how is being at Delmont helping you engineer for this kind of an environment? Well, fortunately, the systems that were here before also addressed that problem. And the cabinetry that we put our system in is double walled, it's ceramically coated, and all the electronics have been environmentally uh, produced. So we choose only the type of elements that have got the credentials and certificates of compliance to be weather worthy. We can work in the rain, we can work in the mists, we can work in the fog. I'm not worried about that environmental. The metals that we use are uh, uh, forms of stainless steel that do not corrode. We also use a lot of plastics that do not corrode in the sale and the salt environment. We've thought that through. We have experience with that. Uh, and, and Hawaii, actually, with this mild climate, is going to be quite easy to work with. We're very confident in Hawaii. So maybe I need to go up to your site and uh, get trained up or get educated on some of the uh, materials you're using. That would be a nice thing. You're certainly welcome to come up. Yeah. So where are you in the project? What's the status of the project right now? Well, at this point, uh, the electrical specifications have been known, the sensors, the controls, and Sergey and his team have pulled together what's called the PNID, which is the process instrumentation diagram that shows all the different components in the system. And we've done this before, so there's nothing really new here. What is rather new is the choice of a microprocessor that is within today's technology. Today's technology is uh, based on the internet. It's called the Internet of Things, the IoT. And to be able to control the system or talk to the cloud and back from the cloud requires up-to-date equipment, which, which we're now implementing. In the past, old vendors have given us rather archaic equipment, and we have neglected that. We don't want that. We want, for Nelha, the state of the art. And I think you'll be very, very happy to see what we have. It's an extremely intelligent system. The human machine interface, which is the interface that allows people to look at what the system is doing, will be existent in three spots. It'll be at the system, it'll be in the control offices here at Nelha, and it can be worldwide in California, all over the United States, or anywhere on the islands. So uh, we're, we're pretty well designed up, and now we're just waiting for the approval to go ahead. So what's the kind of timeline? I mean, that, that triggers the other point. It's okay, you've done the engineering side. So where are we in the total project? When do you expect to have it operational? People always ask me about that, my hydrogen project. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my understanding that sometime through March, we will get the approval to go into the second phase of the project. Right. And that second phase is the actual building phase. Now, we have people coming from the Department of Energy to look at the various uh, engineering developments that we have that are new and once they approve it and the project gets approved we then start putting together the systems the electronic part for me is rather simplistic in that we already have the components and we've used them before some of the mechanical things have to be tuned to the site so we, they have to be physically built and Sergey and his team have worked through the design okay. so we're probably uh, mid-year to end of the year as being getting a, pretty much the system together. So was there a lot of work in like, uh, you know, bringing the uh, array back back online? I mean, it's been, it's been sitting there for many years, so. Was that, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't, there? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not the one that qualified to answer that question. Okay. We've looked at the array, and we do know that we're gonna have to work with it. We're gonna electronically communicate with the array, understand how it's working, understand how it's phasing to the sun, we're gonna understand its performance, but the array gives us the hot water that we need. Right. Yeah. We do have a backup here in that there is a, a propane-powered heater that we can use right. to supplement the array should the array still need some servicing and, and whatnot. So we, there's a backup on that, okay. but we're looking forward to that. Today we were out on the array and we saw tremendous work being done towards getting it back up again. Right. And uh, it seems to be a pretty solid array and I think it'll yeah. work fine. We don't, as Sergey pointed out, we don't need the full differential temperature. Right. That array produces much more heat than, than actually we need. Right. Uh, it's a wonderful array. So we'll just use the heat from that and we'll be fine. Yeah, and the anchors for the, uh, the uh, solar collectors are pretty massive. They are. Yeah, I think they could withstand a pretty heavy hurricane. Just like my awning has got this massive footing for it. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure why it should be so big. So um, at this stage of the uh, interviews, I always ask, what have I not asked or what have we not 
um, um, tell the audience, is there anything, any parting information that we need to cover that you'd like to cover? Well, from my standpoint in the company, uh, there are some issues that we have to absolutely address. Uh, one is the security issues. As you know, hacking and these kind of things happen. Right. Anytime you have a, a link to a system that's that's run such as this, we have to protect ourselves and put up firewalls so that so that people won't be able to get in there and, and toy with the system. So that's a, we're going to look into that. And that, may, that means getting the computer systems that are here at Nelha communicating with our system. Right. And that we've done that before, so that's not a problem. We're, uh, I'm a little concerned about the, um, uh, the, the availability of some of the parts that we will need that are available in the United States. So we're going to make to make sure that we have a spare parts inventory here. Right. And by that, I mean the things that need to be swapped out. Some of the membranes that might be wearing out, some of the unique little parts and pieces, make, make sure that's in place. And then the training. An important part of this system is the ability to train the people to understand and handle any situation. So we need to set up class time. And hopefully we can do that class time before the system is up so that the people that are going to be running the system can be friendly with it and treat it as a friend and not some technology thing that they can't handle. So, so training is important and security is important. So about how many people do you think will be required to run this system? Um, between four and six, perhaps, okay. you know, and that they're just mostly overseeing it. The system will tell you when it's doing something wrong or when it's alarming or if something's not happening. Right. So there will be alerts and those alerts can come all the way down to a cell phone alert. So right. somebody might suddenly get a message on their text that the system needs a maintenance or it needs a tweak or something along that line. So we're, ideally, uh, in some of our systems, only a single operator is needed, but that's on a smaller system. Here, you're going to probably need someone to watch the solar arrays at some point in time, someone to watch our part of the system, the water flows. So I'd say three, four, five people would be fine. Right. So uh, just to be clear, you're uh, making uh, taking advantage of the uh, seawater supply that Nelha supplies. Correct? Absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. Well, that's it. I mean, we're believe it or not, we're out of time. So uh, thank you for thank allowing you me to speak. So much for being here, and it sounds like a great project. I'd love to go up and see it sometime, and uh, see how I, I, as I said, leverage some of the lessons learned, uh, particularly on the material side. Uh, so I'd enjoy doing that. Thank so, you. Congratulations. Look forward to seeing it. So thank you. That's it uh, for today, um, and we will be back uh, next week at Hawaii, the state of uh, clean energy. So aloha, everybody.